Hey, Michael, how are you doing? So I'm, I'm, I'm great. I'm just uh, ready to talk and relax. So uh, wherever, we, wherever we go, uh, we don't know in advance where it's going, but we will know when we're in the journey. Well, thanks so much for making some time. Hey, I got to tell you, I've been reading a bit of the back catalog and I've been reading uh, what's worth fighting for in the principalship over the last little while. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, my first one here was your 1982 classic, uh, The Meaning of Educational Change, which is also a very effective doorstop, actually, Michael, just uh, the <laughs> sheer size of this. And today I want to pick up and get right into uh, what's worth fighting for for in the principalship and as you'll see uh this 1988 book uh is about the size of the preface of your 1982 book and so i want to get kind of right in and just ask you um you know what was the genesis of this book like where did it come from yeah it's um i i, I would like to uh start with the 70s where I was kind of a, a rookie assistant professor and never yeah. had taken a course in education, let alone taught one. So I started when uh, OISE was uh, literally established its sociology department, and yeah. I was one of the first members. My thesis supervisor, Jan Lubzer, was hired as a chair of the department, and he said, oh, do you want to come and work with me? So we, that was the start of my career. But there, the the first significant thing was the term implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, when I uh, got started my job, which was 1968 as a lecturer assistant professor, the uh, the implementation term was just being uh, created basically for the first time. So yeah. John Goodlad behind the classroom door, uh -huh. uh, Seymour Saracen, the you know the culture of the school and the problem of change. Yeah, uh, and Neil Gross was another one about implementing organizational innovations. Literally, the term uh, implementation only came into play around 1970, which was literally when I was starting. So yeah, that good uh, timing. I, yeah, very good timing, uh, because we're no experts to uh, tell me I was wrong. And, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, what? probably the line that caught me most uh, was a, a line in Seymour Saracen's book where he, he said, what was happening with new math and some other things he talked about, we knew two things. Something was happening. Yeah. And then he said... And we also know that teachers were not in on it. That's wow. the way he phrased it. Mm. And so that was the problem of change. So I, so I spent the 70s kind of uh, uh, thinking about the implementation problem because yeah. I didn't have any competition. And it was easy to do that. And I wrote a, I wrote a good, I did edited a journal. It was called Inter Interchange, a special issue okay. uh, that we had at OISE at the time. And uh, I wrote the introduction uh, as part of a set of articles. It was called An Overview of the innovative process and the user, an overview of innovation yeah. and the user. The yeah. user was the implement, implementer. So that's, I guess I would say if I was English, I was swanning around in the 70s with yeah. implementation. And uh, with one of my graduate students, we wrote quite a great uh, oh. review of research uh, on, um, on review of, of implementation. It was 1977, it got published in RER, -R -R, Review of Educational Research. Alan Pomfret was his name. And so that really made us experts because we really did cover the field. And I was then, I guess I'll say, uh, right in it in terms of the theory of it or the the, the practical uh, uh, fact that it wasn't working. So it was that that got me uh, later into, uh, I did the meaning, the new meaning, or sorry, the meaning of educational change, first edition, uh, just to map it out. It was really an academic exercise and I yeah. I got a lot out of it. But it was going, none of that was going anywhere other than I was a witness to implementation. Got it. So uh, getting to your question now uh, is that the, uh, the, uh, the executive director of the teachers union, elementary mm -hmm. school teachers union, uh, came to see me one day and said, oh, we want our principals are increasingly having problems. The, yeah. the job is not satisfying. There's too many things coming at them. Uh, we want, uh, he said, I'm going to give you uh, we want you to write a booklet that could help them in that situation. Okay. And he said, I, I, you know, I've got these criteria. It should, here, I will give you the title, what's worth fighting for in the principalship, because we think it's out of control. We want it, we want to claim yeah, it. It's a good title. It's, and, it's catchy. Yeah, it was good. I mean, that was a good way of putting it. And then he said, and the book should be uh, short. Yeah. It should be, uh, it should be practical. And it should be cover 
cover all the issues. Yeah. And I said to him jokingly, well, you could have two of those three, but not all three of those. <laughs> and so, uh, but I, I took it, but literally, I didn't know at the time, it forced me to write in a more concise way and convey a message to practitioners because the audience was going to be uh, assistant principals and principals and uh, teacher leaders. And so I had never written for that audience. And that's how I got into the habit. And I, I had an instinct, I guess, yeah. of uh, saying things uh, and, and using words that captured the reality of people. And they, they I remember the favorite reaction I wanted to get after I got it a couple of times yeah. was, it was as if you were in my school when you wrote this paragraph. Got it. And so that's, uh, I, I wrote that uh, kind of practical and still now, I, I have to say, I haven't reread the, the What's Worth Fighting for, The Principalship, but I would say it's probably one of my better books in terms of inspiring a practicing principal who hundreds of them, more than that, have said to me, that was at my, when I was at that stage of my career, that's what saved me from going under. That's what I really wow. gravitated toward. So what I discovered was the knack of writing briefly and more deeply and accurately and getting at the... Um, the world of the principal in this that uh, case that wasn't a good world at the time, but yeah. giving really you know, you saw the in the what's worth fighting for the um, guidelines that we uh, had about here's what you should do here's how you should think yeah. and it gave them a way of uh, having something to uh, react to their situation uh, ten ten uh, ten reasons or ten things you can do and it wasn't a recipe it was a kind of but it was a, a, a a, a guide to action and a really a stimulus to action. So I learned more than the average reader, I guess, of that book just by writing the book. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So here we have this text that almost, it's a book that lets Fullen find Fullen. It was the way that you were going to start to engage in the world, insightful, concise, action oriented, um, understanding that this was about positioning people in a complex non-linear environment and not giving them silver bullets right and actually giving them uh, heuristics or guiding principles that can help them make uh, even better decisions so uh, i love how you've kind of described for me michael sort of this the 70s like discovering implementation discovering innovation even some of the language you're using it, it's fascinating to me thinking about uh, even now, as we think about implementation science and innovation and our core user, actually, uh, 40 years before we were using all this language, what I'm discovering and re-going through this is that uh, these were concepts that you were already absolutely playing around with in the 70s. And uh, I think some of us thought we were rediscovering them in the 2010s. Hey, tell me a, a little bit about the educational change ideas that were circulating at the time in your part of the world in the late 80s. And I suppose in that, you know, what were you encouraging principals to start fighting for or to take a stand for? Well, the the ideas that were around was first the uh, the actual discovery during the uh, the 70s that implementation was even a problem. People yeah. thought, okay, here are the good ideas. Well, it's too bad teachers didn't take them up. They're kind of slow on the uptake. But uh, ne ne people never thought it was a problem with the strategy. They just yeah. said people don't like innovation, don't like change. And so what I was able to do was saying, these ideas are, uh, they're not being taken up because they're actually not in a form where they help people know what to do. Wow. And so I think uh, there was a really uh, a complete lack of clarity in the, uh, the 80s and 90s about, uh, and it was, it wasn't at the surface of, uh, it wasn't like, oh, macro change isn't working. It was yeah. more like, oh, there's something wrong at the local level, the individual school. So people weren't thinking uh, uh, of the of the total situation. They just really were, uh, I guess I'll say, somewhat bemused by, uh, well, this is, yeah. It got, remember, this was post Sputnik uh, eventually uh, after 1957 and so forth, where innovation was thought to be the solution. Yeah. We're behind the Russians. We have to innovate in science and math. And so it was all about innovation. And that was going to be the salve. It was going to be the salvation. But it turns out a growing realization uh, during the 70s and 80s that innovation actually wasn't the answer. It wasn't working. And the yeah. innovations probably weren't in a form that would have the impact that people 
theoretically and abstractly thought would happen. So I think people were confused. It was a, it was a muddle period. And it looked at the beginning, innovation like exciting so it could keep going and the society was okay yeah. in the in the 70s, uh, let's say in the 80s. Uh, but it, uh, it, it it took about a decade or maybe even 15 years to realize we have to change uh, tact on this. We have to we have to step back and say, what's the system doing? And yeah. I think that's the what's worth fighting for. Uh, helped me two ways. One is it got me in the world, the practical world of the principle. I say, okay, now I can see what makes people tick when they're on the receiving end. But then you have to you have to start to think, well, what is the answer, anyways? What is the uh, uh, what, what is going on in the dynamics of change in the world? And then we'll eventually talk about change forces. But that's when I took the leap from the practical word of the principle yeah. back into the world of, uh, of chaotic change, change forces, uh, dynamic theories, really abstract. But it wasn't uh, it wasn't a very uh, people didn't worry that it wasn't organized. They just were experiencing these ad hoc things and uh, not giving two thoughts about it, I don't think, about where it should go. Yeah, it's so helpful for you to locate and the mental models that were operating at the time. Look, you were talking there about getting right on the, the, the coal face or the ground floor here of the life of school leaders and particularly the principal. And I know in the book, you kind of explore this notion of dependency. So what is this idea of dependency? What is it kind of, where did you see it stemming from? And what are its what are its effects if you sort of let it take hold in a system as a principle? Well, the without saying it, and I think Seymour Saracen was a, I consider him one of my uh, great mentors because he was a friend of David Hunt, who was a psychologist at uh, at Oise, and uh, Seymour would come up every uh, every twelve months and give lectures, and I was just a junior professor sitting in the back of the room, I and see. he. Uh, so he and he actually kind of modeled around it himself a lot, but uh, it was really kind of stirring kind of the uh, a very um, unclear situation. And he used to reflect on it. And, uh, and so I got into the practical insights about that. But uh, for some reason, I didn't stay at the just the practical. I leaped into the change forces, which we'll talk about later. So it got me back into the bigger picture. And I think if I take the dependency, and this turns out to be uh, even more important now. Yeah. But uh, what I saw principals doing is they were looking for the answers. They said, okay, it's, I'm not getting the, the clear direction, so I don't know what to do. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's where we point things while you're looking for answers in the wrong places. Uh, what's worth fighting for is to, uh, is to not be so dependent because they don't know what they're doing either. <laughs> so don't 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 you know, don't get stuck on that. Uh, 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 see your role as discovering clarity. Yeah, and not uh, yeah, not yeah, waiting for it just, to be delivered to you. Discovering yeah, it in action. Yeah, your whole your role should be thought about is how do I discover the clarity that I know is going to be helpful in my school? And it turns out the external clarity is uh, missing. Yeah, but then later on, and, and when I got into things, even when it was crystal clear on the outside, I said, "Still don't trust it, because it's somebody else's clarity." Got it. You better be independent of that. I love this. Hey, Michael, I, I, I'm finding a couple of quotes here that I was uh, reading over a few glasses of red. I like this one: "Distant system solutions are not much use to the leader who yearns to make positive improvements in the face of great complexity." I mean, that feels to me the sort of sentence you could have written in 2020, 2021. How about this one? The challenge is to improve education in the only way it can be through the day-to-day -day actions of empowered individuals. That's what's worth fighting for in the school principalship. And I kind of love this analysis that you're talking through about at the system level, you know, people thinking, oh, well, we've got the strategy, they just need to implement it, but they hadn't mm -hmm. actually developed things that were implementable and adaptable at that school level. And then you're saying on the other side, school leaders saying, hey, has someone up there got the clarity? Are you going to give me the thing you need me to do? Uh, again, because of that sort of hierarchical dependency type uh, relationship. And what I found fascinating getting back into this, Michael, was, you know, one, this sense of you were grappling with complexity theory, nonlinear change, human dynamics. 
And you kind of just landed educational change, not in the simple change bucket, not in the complicated bucket, but in, in complexity uh, and, and systems type thinking being the only way we can kind of grapple with it. And then I kind of hear that if that's the context of complexity, you sort of said, well, there are no silver bullets uh, and we're not going to mm. solve the problem. You talk about problems being our friends. That's the learning uh, challenge that we step into. And what I thought was elegant in the solution was that rather than it being a solution, you gave a set of um, guidelines for action that allowed someone to navigate a complex environment. And I, I want to I get into some of these because they're classics, Michael. You gave a list of 10, and I'm sure in the notes we'll put down uh, this first list. You've always been a great lister, actually. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I want to give you a couple of these. Uh, number seven, decide what you are not going to do. Uh, you know, resonance there with, you know, Jim Collins and others, this idea of like a not doing list. What are you going to pull back? What are you going to prune back so you can focus on that core work? Uh, give up on the search for silver bullets. Yeah. Uh, focus on the fundamentals of curriculum, instruction, assessment, and professional culture. You know, these, these kind of beautiful kind of guidelines for action. Again, um, for me, uh, you know, as someone who works with a lot of a side by side with a lot of principals, they're both empowering uh, in that they give you ways to move forward, but they're not restrictive as in they need to be yeah. a set of steps. Hey, let me ask you about this one because I think it becomes a core sort of <laughs> little uh, notion that you build on over and over again over the next uh, 30 years or so from this. Number two, start small, think big, don't over plan or over manage. Can you speak to, to, to the genesis of that kind of thinking about why starting small, thinking big, not over planning and not over managing is a, is a great guiding principle hmm. for action and complexity for a principle? Yeah, I, I didn't. I, for our discussion here, I didn't go back and leaf through the book. I wanted oh, no. to be, uh, you know, so my memory is going to be uh, stimulated or not by, by things. But I remember one of the things I said of what's worth fighting for which was a break, breakthrough, but I didn't, uh, I, it was intuitive or I picked it up and it has lasting value. And what it was, I said, if you're a principal yeah. and you wake up tomorrow morning, don't, on any given day, don't assume the system knows what it's doing. <laughs> so uh, that, that, was, that was kind of the fundamental uh, breaking That's it apart. It's heretical to say, how did that land with people? Did they sort of think, did he just say that? Is he allowed to say that? <laughs> Yeah, well, they like they loved it because they knew it. They yeah. they knew that that's what they were experiencing. Is yeah. they were when they thought about it, they said the system doesn't know what it's keep doing. It keeps keeps being vague. With one, they tell us one thing one one day, another. They don't yeah. give us help. They were that was their world. So my my discovery in writing that book, and I thank the teacher union for that key discovery, is that that wherever you are in the system, and this applies to everybody actually, yeah. is yeah. that. It's so, it's so many layers in that. You don't, please don't assume that other people really know what they're doing. And we now know later that, that one of the variables in leadership is, oh, uh, really confident people are dangerous because they don't know, uh, they think they're better than they are. So yes. let, I keep wanting to draw it back to the individual looking at this stuff and saying, this is pretty uh, vague and a lot of people may think they know what it is, but they really don't. And I can understand why that's the case. So it's my job, not only to get my individual clarity, but to work with others, my teachers, my community, other principals to seek that clarity. So it's always, clarity has always been for me, a process of seeking uh, that, not arriving at uh, crystal clarity, but uh, developing it and looking into it. And, coming at it. So I think even today now, don't assume the system knows what it's doing right away. You know, that this is a good way of putting it. Yes. And then, you know, one of the other ones you put here is uh, avoid if only statements, externalizing the blame and other forms of wishful thinking. And what I like about this, Michael, is, you know, there's, there's many who've sat in your sort of academic positions and simply sit on the critical side of analysis of the system doesn't know what it's doing or the system is using the wrong uh, process of trying to improve education. But you sort of have this sense of, well, look, yeah, the, the system doesn't have all the answers. And often when they have a strategy, that strategy is not packaged in a really theory of action. 
But the answer to that at the school level is not to say, well, once the system works out the answers, you know, if only they would get their act together or if only yeah. that was clear, then we could act. You say, no, 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 we've got to uh, explore collaboratively together about the nature of what we need to do. And, and that clarity is going to be an emergent property of that taking action, learning, uh, but even parts that you've put in here that, to be honest, <laughs> I couldn't believe that some of these ideas have been around this long. And look, that's the naivety here of the, uh, the elder uh, millennial coming in. But, you know, when you think about uh, design firms like IDEO in the last 20 years, they've got famous on ideas like a bias towards action, start small and iterate, um, work with rapid prototypes of ideas and then scale up. And I'm sitting here thinking, hey, Michael was talking about all of these things here in the late 80s. You literally say, start small, a bias for action, ready, fire, aim, get into the work with a good enough plan and then scale up over time. And so, yeah, well, you know, if, these if ideas talk are about, as fresh as ever. Uh, you know, and nowadays I talk about nuance, but uh, there is a nuance back then, which is if you, if you get into that, just take the if only part. If people are, are saying as they were, if only the system was clear about what it wanted, uh, and then I could do something about it. And, you know, all I had to do is say, uh, listen to yourself. You're saying if if only other people knew what to do, I could follow the orders. Is that how you want to be a leader? I mean, right instantly, people have the nuanced kind of int uh, insight that if only is should not be the solution. And pro probably if only will never happen, if, it'll never be clear. But even if it did, it would be bad because it would be other people telling me what I should do. I don't want to be a leader like that. And people discovered their own uh, desires to be a leader once you broke it open that way. And I think that's what that's why the, the those books worked because it got to those people who wanted to do something and said, aha, this is uh, this is right. Like, what am I doing? I'm barking up the wrong tree. Yeah, I like it. So we've been talking a lot here about, you know, what does a school principal do to position themselves in complexity? Uh, position themselves with an attitude of saying, yeah, I don't expect the system to have all the answers. And hey, even if they gave me all the answers, I'd probably resist that because they're not actually letting me be an actor. I've got one more yeah. quote here for you before we close up for, for this chat, Michael. Uh, you talk, of course, about the need for school principals to take that action. And it feels to me in this book, you're also beginning to conceptualize what you want the system to do. Right. You're definitely not letting the system off the hook uh, or those in system roles. And you're not suggesting that they just back away and just let the schools do what they need to do. You say this, um, and in the mid run, school systems must take action to create, insist on support and be responsive to the conditions for school based action, not in isolation, but as part of a visible interactive network of public commitment to actual and knowledge improve an actual and acknowledged improvement so tell me just briefly here what are you grappling with at this stage of your work around what is the role of an enabling system i, I have to I would say that i didn't know what i was talking about in a, in a kind of deep way about that <laughs> then yeah because i was more concerned about uh, let's say the the micro world of all these principles trying to do something in a system that was all over the place. So my 95% of my energy and thinking was uh, pick pick your better lanes yourself, work together, to all those things, those 10 guidelines I gave so that you can manage in this kind of system because it's, it's not really uh, uh, conducive to you being well-organized and doing things. So take it at that. And then I, I had a few speculative thoughts, well, the system should do this. But when we talk about some of the later books, once I got into um, into 1988 and then into 2003, I was in the position to help the system do something differently. And then it came together. So this was kind of a, a, a harbinger of some of the ideas, but I knew if the system couldn't make the world helpful for the principal, the solution was not going to be to tighten it all up so it could be handed down to the principal. I knew that, but I didn't know exactly how a system to do it. Love it. Well, Michael, it's all right with you. We might pick that line of thinking up in a later conversation. Hey, Michael, thanks yes. for connecting. Looking forward to the next one.
Yeah, this has been great. It's just uh, pulls me back into uh, 50 years almost. So this is, uh, even in those days, the system didn't know what it was doing, I could say. Thank <laughs> you for opening it up. See you, Michael. Bye. Yeah.